It's been exactly one year since Brittany T disappeared. Tonight, friends and family held a candlelight vigil for the Brookfield woman, hoping to renew interest in her missing person case. WBC's Ken McLeod is live in Brookfield with more on it. Ken? Chris, the town common, as you can see, is quiet now, but close to 100 people were gathered here about 90 minutes ago to call attention to the case of a 35-year-old store clerk who has now been missing, literally without a trace, for a year. Cause you got a heart so big. Dozens of folks huddled on a chilly Brookfield common tonight with candles they hope might provide some warmth and strength for a grieving family, including Susan T. I'm not giving up. I just need her home. She's talking about her daughter, Brittany, last seen exactly a year ago tonight. Her boyfriend telling police she walked away from the house they shared on Main <coughs> Street and vanished. I'm her big sister. I'm supposed to be keeping her safe and hurts knowing that I am not there if she needs me. Police scoured 250 acres along routes 9 and 148, searching as recently as last month, but finding nothing. A puzzling mystery that still haunts this small town. Every day is not a day that goes by that you don't think about her wondering, is she safe? But most who join this vigil tonight acknowledge it's hard to be hopeful given the lack of evidence this last year has produced. Police still insist their ongoing investigation is not criminal and that everyone they've spoken <coughs> to has been cooperative. But family members certainly fear something sinister. What else could have happened to her? Some, something happened. I don't feel like she's, you know, hiding on purpose. Brittany T's boyfriend did not report her missing. Her family did that three days later. They say police have done everything they can, but frustration was evident on the town common tonight after a year that has felt much longer. Trying to stay positive, trying to stay hopeful that we'll get answers. The biggest fear among family and friends is that they'll still have no answers when another anniversary rolls around. Now, the Worcester DA assured people tonight that investigators won't stop and they have dedicated a tip line solely to this case. Live in Brookfield tonight, Ken McLeod, WBZ News. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining. Let me get rid of this because it's going to keep playing. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining. Um, sorry, I'm kind of um, <clears throat> feeling a little bit under underwater this evening. So I'm going to do my best. But I want to preface this uh, discussion tonight with um just a quick disclaimer i uh i have compiled a lot of information about britney's case um, mostly in my blog and entirely fact checked by family members but i do want to let you guys know um that this is very different from uh the cases that i've spoken about before um because this is newer. I'm in direct contact with a family member and I'm actually super nervous to discuss this um, because I don't want to um, mess anything up. I don't want to piss anyone off. So I'm, I'm literally going off the facts that I've had verified by um, her family and um, it's not a lot of information. So I just wanted to give a little disclaimer that this is not a very robust episode. It's not like the last one that we did uh, about John Bonet, where there were four hours worth of things to talk about. This is um, fresher. It hits way closer to home. Um, there is not a lot definitively that we know about what's going on with Brittany, what happened to her last year. So I'm going to, you know, walk you guys through what we do know as factual. And um, then we're going to take a few minutes and discuss some of the rumors that have gone on um, around social media, around citizen detective forums and things like that, um, about Brittany as a person and about, uh, you know, different things that have come up as speculation that are not factually true. So 
Anyway, <laughs> um, and also I want to start as well with a um, giant heartfelt thank you to Bethany T, who uh, you saw in the news coverage that I just played. Um, she is Brittany's sister, and she is an in incredible, incredible voice for her sister. She is very, she's, she's so strong. I can't personally imagine going through what she's been through. And she is so wonderful to speak to. She has been nothing but forthcoming and incredibly courteous and kind to me. So I wanted to give a big thank you to Bethany for fact checking everything for me, um, for not calling me a jerk by reaching out to her just unsolicited to ask for information um, and for trusting me to discuss her sister's case, to discuss Brittany, who she is as a person um, and what happened to her last year. Uh, Bethany, you're amazing and um, I salute you so much. And uh, same with your mother, Susan, um, who has also passed on some very kind words about the blog that I wrote last month. Um, so yeah, that's that. Um, I just wanted to make sure that I gave credit where it was due because Bethany has been incredible. She's answered my questions with poise and she's just a lovely, lovely human being. So I wanted to do this um, to put Brittany's name out there as loud as I'm able to. And I mean, we're not looking at a huge volume of people here watching this. I mean, I think live we've got a whole 40 people watching, but I mean, we get the replays on this channel. Um, and I'm just hoping that since a lot of uh, the lovely folks watching tonight came from the Free Karen Reed camp, um, you're mostly local. And um, some people may be from this same area in Massachusetts or an area close to where Brittany disappeared last year. So I want to put her name out there as loudly as I can as just some rando with a YouTube channel, as I've said before. Um, but yeah, so we just want to we want to put her name out there as loud and as many times as we possibly can. And um, I will leave a number in the show notes for tips. Um, if anybody has heard or seen anything um, down in the Brookfield area, I urge you they will take tips anonymously. If you don't want to give your information, it doesn't matter. If you saw something, if you think you saw something, if you know anything, please, please get in touch with this, um, with the tip line that I'll leave in the show notes and um, tell them what you know, because even the smallest thing can make an enormous difference in cases like this. So, um, okay. So that is, that is my little beginning speech. So hi, everybody. Hi, Tracy. Thanks for joining. Hi, Dana. Thank you for coming. Unsafe and Fox, my favorite mods in the biz. Thank you so much for being here with me. Um, so that's interesting, Donna. I don't know who Ashley Babbitt is, but I'm going to have to look that up when we get off tonight. Um, she does have to me, I remember the first time I saw a picture of Brittany. Um, let's see if I can make myself tiny again. I don't know if I can do that. Probably not. Um, I'm not going to mess with it. So anyway, um, I remember the first time I saw a picture of Brittany and I was like, oh my God, don't I know that girl? I feel like I've met her before. She has one of those faces and... Oh, okay. Okay. Unsafe. Thank you. Um, she has one of those faces that's just so striking. And when I saw her picture, I thought to myself, if I don't know her, I want to. She looks like such an open, welcoming, kind human being. And I've heard absolutely nothing different than that from family, um, from friends who have commented on the Facebook group that I'm a part of. She is 
absolutely lovely so kind um she apparently has a very distinctive voice i saw the video once with her voice on it if i can find it i will pull it up because she just and you can tell she just has a way with people just just welcoming them in just embracing them with her amazing kindness and personality like i said i don't know her um, but from the way everyone talks about her, from the way that her sister talks about her, it's obvious that she is an absolute joy. So um, I hope that when Brittany comes home, I get the opportunity to meet her because she sounds like a person who would be an amazing friend. Um, so what we have to go on. Sorry. Sorry facts wise is not a ton, but I will walk you through what I have. Um, the vigil that was mentioned in that news coverage was one that I actually went to, um, which is why I was drawing on experience to write the blog that I wrote back in January. Um, if you haven't read it yet, it is on my old Wix site that I'm trying to phase out. And it is also um, on, it's cross posted on my Substack also. So if you haven't read it, take a look. Um, I put all the information in there that I could verify as factual. Um, there is nothing in there that is speculation. I had everything fact checked tirelessly. Thank you again, Brittany, uh, Bethany, for that because she was kind enough to do that, I think three times for me <laughs> from the beginning. So, um, all right. So uh, I guess the first thing to say um, is, I don't know if you guys know the area of Brookfield, but we're talking about OG Brookfield here. We're not talking about West Brookfield, North Brookfield, or East Brookfield. There are four of them. For those of you guys following along from some other state, yeah, we've got four Brookfields, but we're talking about regular OG Brookfield right now. Um, at the time of her disappearance, Brittany lived on Main Street in Brookfield with her boyfriend. And um, I actually have a map pulled up. I don't want to give out the address. I mean, I'm sure any web sleuth worth their salt could find it given the pictures and everything else, but I'm not here to give out people's information and dox anyone. But what I will say is uh, the last time that Brittany was seen, um, that is verified <clears throat> as fact, the account that was given is that she left the home on Main Street that she shared with her boyfriend and apparently another roommate, um, was 8.30 p.m. on January 10th, 2023. So it was just over a year ago right now. Um, there are rumors out there that she was captured on someone's ring camera or on a CCTV footage after 8.30 that night. This is as far as the police, or as far as... Um, the family has been notified by the police, untrue. Uh, what we have to go on is her boyfriend's word. I will not give his name out on this show, so please don't ask me. Um, as far as anyone is aware, he has cooperated. He has given his account. Um, I do not have any reason to believe that his account is false. Um, people may feel differently, but I'm not here to speculate. So what we know from the account is that she walked out of the house at 8.30 p.m. 8.30 p.m. in January. So we're talking about a pitch dark night in the middle of winter. Um, and she walked out and has not been seen since. That's what we know. We know she left the house and she has not been seen by any person since then that we are aware of. Now, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the area in case you're not familiar. Brookfield is, um, how to put this delicately, um, rural. It's rural. It's very rural. There's not a lot happening there. 
there's not a lot of people there. Um, there's a lot of room in between lots in most places in Brookfield. And uh, it's not very close to really any major metropolis. Um, that's what we're hoping, Donna. That's why I'm doing this, because I feel like the news has not covered much since the vigil last month. Oh, I just realized. There we go. I'm in the frame now. Um, they have not published or um, put out news coverage about Britney's case in, in a month, two months now. I mean, there hasn't been much of anything. And to most people not seeing the name in the news, out of sight, out of mind, her name kind of leaves the zeitgeist a little bit. And um, as I've said about a hundred times already, I don't know Brittany, um, but I know Bethany through my correspondence with her. And I know that the last thing they need is for Brittany's name to be fading from the public eye. So uh, yes, yeah, she did leave on foot. Um, from what I have been able to find out, her car was broken. Um, so she left on foot and she had her phone and her wallet with her, but her phone had no SIM card in it. And we'll get to that in just a minute. I just wanted to give a little bit of background on Brookfield itself, um, just so you guys understand sort of, and you know, you guys know how I operate. I like to know exactly what everything looks like around the area that that whatever crime has occurred or whatever incident has occurred looks like feels like smells like so i've been down there and i think the thing to understand and to make clearest here at the outset is that it was 8 30 at night in january so we're talking about pitch pitch black there is nothing to see. There is, there's no street lights to illuminate the road. There is no, you know, there are homes on the street. Um, and I'll go through a street view with you guys. So you know what I'm talking about here, but there are homes with outside lighting, but we're not talking about a well-lit metropolis here. I mean, this is a very sparsely populated area of Massachusetts. So let me actually grab that <clears throat> street view for you so you can see it too. Um, Mr. Dubs had a question. The police don't believe that anyone. So if they do believe this, um, they are not sharing that information. Let's, let's leave it at that. I'm not sure. Um, as far as we know, um, pretty much what I already went through. That's what we know. That's what we know. All right. So let me put myself back in there a little tiny. There we go. All right. So this is the area that Brittany left on foot. So as you can see, there are plenty of homes in the immediate area of the house. But as you start going down the street, and again, we don't even know for sure which direction she went in. Um, the police are operating on the assumption that she went uh, towards Lewis Field, which is right down the street. Um, I say right down the street because mostly I drove this area. It is not very walkable. Um, so that right off the bat was the first thing I noticed coming down here. I mean, you have this narrow strip right here where someone could walk, but as you go further down the street, whoops, go down that way. As you go further down the street, these trees and, and bushes and everything over here is kind of encroaching on the walkway a little bit. So you're not getting a ton of room to um, walk safely out of the path of traffic. And I don't know if it's really obvious just from looking at it, but this road, not the widest. It's pretty narrow. There's not, um, and as I said, not, not very well illuminated because if you're looking at these poles, I'm looking for street lights as I'm driving down there, there are none. There's none. So 
as you keep going, this right over here on this side, this is the aforementioned Lewis Field. It's over here. So I think the entrance is this little road right here. So that's Lewis Field. The sign's blurry, but that's it. Um, right here. So the police were able to trace Brittany's scent with dogs um, in this direction. So that I think, and I'm not in their heads, I'm not privy to their information, so I couldn't tell you if that's the entire reason they um, started in that direction, but that is what we know. We know that they started going in that direction. There is not a lot of traffic in that area. You're right, unsafe. Not a lot of cars going down. Um, I was able to pretty safely walk along here without really getting um, nervous about much traffic. There wasn't much going on. Um, not a lot of cars coming up and down the road at, I believe it was an hour earlier. It was probably around 7.30 at night when I took this walk. And again, I'll tell you, it is pitch black. There is nothing. There's nothing to see. I mean, yes, these people, they had some exterior lights, um, but that's not going to illuminate the roadway. And especially if it's on this side of the road, you're not going to, it's not going to help you see over here. You're going to want a flashlight. So extremely dark, Fox, extremely um, you know, we're not talking about like pit of nothingness, darkness, but it is very dark. Um, so the going theory that police were working on, given that her scent was tracked, is that she started in that direction towards Lewis Field. Now, there are, um, there were also scents picked up here on Maple Street and Maple Street at the end of Maple Street, there is a business called um, Bay Path. Um, oh my God, I'm sorry. Bay Path Spirits, um, which is where Brittany used to work. Uh, at the time of her disappearance, she no longer worked there. Um, that is another thing that sort of needed clearing up, I think, um, is that Brittany was no longer employed by Bay Path Spirits, but she was actively looking for new employment. Um, I have that from her sister. So, all right, we've got, so Maple Street is not much better as far as illumination. Cause as I said, not a lot happening here. There are a few homes, um, but I drove this at night. I walked over here at night. There is nothing, there are no lights. So you get to the end here eventually Eventually you get to the end of the street. Well, it's further. Um, usually I keep this little guy up to guide me a little better on this because I'm usually not going so rapidly down the road on my street view, but here we go. Here's the end. So you come down to the end of May or Maple and this is Bay Pass Spirits right here. Um, there are uh, as I said, the, the dogs were able to track her scent up Maple as well. However, it's possible that, uh, the scent that they picked up going up Maple street was older because she did frequently walk in that area. So it's possible she could have taken a walk down to Bay Path the night before or a couple nights before, and her scent was still lingering. Um, the police did tell the family that it's possible the scent was not from her, uh, from the time of her disappearance, but could have been a couple days older. Um, so we know that she was last seen by her boyfriend who she lived with, um, her boyfriend and the roommate and her boyfriend's brother were all in agreement about this account of her leaving the house at 830. Previous to her leaving, so working up to that evening during the day of January 10th, uh, 2023, uh, Brittany spoke to her sister, Bethany, um, setting up a time for Bethany to give Brittany uh, her psoriasis medication later on that day. 
Um, everything seemed normal when they spoke. There was nothing wrong. There was no hint of issues. Uh, and that evening, Brittany called her mother, Susan, from her boyfriend's cell phone. This is important to note. Her cell phone had abruptly stopped working at some point during the day after she spoke to Bethany, but before she spoke to her mother. So during the day, sometime her phone stopped working. Um, details on that, I don't have much. That is literally what I know, is that her phone stopped working um, and the SIM card had been taken out of the phone. That to me um, seems kind of antiquated. I don't think I've heard the term SIM card in a few years. Um, different cell phone carriers have different um, activations on their phones. So I do know there are a couple of brands that still use the physical SIM card, but I haven't had one personally in years because the um, carrier that I use is on this eSIM. So you don't even need to, you just need to sign in basically. Um, but the SIM card had been removed from her cell phone. Uh, it was found in the house after her disappearance. We don't know who removed the SIM card from her phone, and we don't know when the SIM card was removed from her phone. We just know it was found in the house. We don't even know if that's the exact SIM card that went in her cell phone for argument's sake. We know a SIM card was found in the house, and her phone didn't work. That's what we know. Um, we do know there was a ping on her phone and rumors abound about this as well. Um, but what I have from Bethany, yeah, no one ever takes those out. What's the reasoning for taking your SIM card out um, at all? I mean, I would think if your phone is not working and you need to get a new phone, you would have to take the SIM card out. But I would, I would think um, that you would wait until you got your new phone. But I like, like I said, I haven't had a SIM card in years, so I'm not really sure entirely how that works anymore because it just, it's been so long. Um, so according to Bethany, um, I'm going to read this actually directly from her. Let me find it. Um, okay. Uh, um, no, okay. I don't have it. I wrote it in my blog. Anyway, so um, we know that the SIM card was no longer in her phone, but we do know that when Brittany left the house, she had her wallet and her cell phone with her, her non-functioning phone with her. Um, oh, that's interesting. Unsafe. If you're having internet problems, one, two. there we go. I mean, possibly that's interesting. Um, I didn't know that was a troubleshoot because again, I haven't had a SIM in years. So that's, that's a good thought process to use on this. I mean, why would the SIM card be on her phone? Maybe it was a troubleshoot. Maybe she was trying to get it working again. Um, we don't know besides that, because like I said, I'm not here to speculate. So I don't want to say like, oh, maybe someone took it out. Maybe it's, you know, maybe she took it out so that no one could find her. We don't know. We, we don't know. Um, we do know that when Brittany left the house, she was wearing a black coat and I'll show you a picture. Let me grab it. Um, a hoodie jeans and work boots. So she was dressed appropriately for the weather. Um, it was cold that night. I don't know exactly how cold, but it's January in Massachusetts. It was cold. Um, let me pull up the pictures. Um, so you can see what I mean because you say black coat. It's like, Oh, well, yeah, of course, everyone in Massachusetts has one of those. Um, it's not like it was distinct. It was just, Hey, this is um, a surveillance photo that was taken not long before she disappeared. Um, this is the black coat. I have heard this is the black coat. This is surveillance 
footage of her from a um, gas station a few days before she disappeared. So that is the black coat. She was wearing a hoodie under that, jeans and work boots when she disappeared. Um, so at least we know she was dressed appropriately for the weather. It's not like she walked outside in a t-shirt or just a sweatshirt. At least she had a winter coat and boots on. Um, while we're on details, I just want to put out there, uh, Brittany at the time of her disappearance was 35. She has brown hair, blue eyes. She is about five foot six and 120 pounds. Um, and she has a tattoo of a flower on the top of her left foot. So those are, again, details that you can find on the missing poster, but I just want to put them out there. Um, so we know that she disappeared from the house, supposedly, at 8.30 p.m. on January 10th. And outside of that, we don't know much of anything. Um, we do know that there have been a lot of rumors out there about where she went, why she went, everything else, but none of those things are facts. Um, that's really, that's one of the big reasons I wanted to do this video is because, okay, cool. Look at that. Unsafe with, for the win here, uh, 30 to 32 degrees. That's actually, um, quite warm for that time of year, but we're looking at around freezing. Um, if you're just walking down the street, it's cold, it's going to get colder. So that's not, I mean, I would hope personally that she had something going on. She had someone who was supposed to come and pick her up because walking, um, I mean, I've walked my dog late at night sometimes it, it could be one in the morning and it's cold and even if you're just walking the neighborhood your hands get cold your face gets cold your your ears get cold everything else but it's just jeans and a coat and boots like it's not snow pants and thermals and you know crazy uh frostbite prevention wear or anything like that it's just normal coat jeans boots so, um, all right, as far as reporting, so let's talk about reporting. We are getting snow right now. Oh, and so has Ben. I think maybe it stopped here, but it was spitting a little bit today. And I thought for the first day of spring, that was mildly inappropriate. Um, so let's talk about how the sequence of events that, um, set off this massive search for Brittany. So she was not seen after 8.30 p.m. on January 10th, 2023. Um, it was kind of like she just walked out the door and disappeared into thin air. Her boyfriend did not report her missing that night. Um, his account states that he was under the impression that Brittany's mom, Susan, had picked her up to spend the night at her parents' house. Um, but he never reached out to confirm that. Um, so we don't know exactly where his mind was at. Obviously, we don't know what's going on in anyone's head ever. Um, yeah, it's the first day, first day of spring. So obviously, we're going to get snow. Um, anyway, so he never reached out um, to confirm whether she was with her mother. And when Brittany failed to check in with Susan or Bethany, um, they discovered she hadn't been seen since January 10th. So we're talking about two days because on the 12th, she was reported missing by Susan and Bethany to the Mass State Police. And then they went to the Brookfield Police Department to report her missing on the 13th. So we're talking about a two to three day window here where no one knew where she was. So the search started and the media got involved pretty much right away. And the news reports about Brittany's disappearance started airing on January 15th. So this is five days after she supposedly walked out of the house and never came back. So Where'd she go? 
that's what everyone wants to know, right? Where did she go? What happened? Who, who, who did she come into contact with? You know, because apparently from what I've been able to learn, there has been um, no sighting. The police started and concentrated their initial searches in a very tight radius, about a mile um, surrounding the, the home that she was last seen at, her home with her boyfriend, um, and then eventually expanded it to include the Maple Street area, the Bay, uh, Bay Path Spirits area, the Lewis Field area. They, they were just running in these rapidly expanding circles to try and find really anything that would lead them to understand where she went or what could have happened to her. So uh, there were ground searches. Um, there were canines brought in. There were air searches. They used helicopters. They searched waterways. I mean, every angle of this was covered. Land, air, sea, you name it. They searched it. Um, Canine units did track her scent, like I mentioned already, um, in the direction of Lewis Field. And actually, let me bring up the overhead view of that so you can see what I mean. Oops. Let's do that in. Oh my God. My Twitter's blowing up, guys. All right, here we go. So let's, let's share that. Let's give you guys a, an impression of what I'm talking about. Um, here we go. So you're looking at Brookfield right here. I just want this gone. There we go. All right. So the area that they're looking in now, the home was around this area right here. Lewis Field is here and Bay Path is over here um, at the head of, whoops, right here, I think. Let me zoom in further so I can get, yeah, right here. Okay. So we're including now in the search, initially, we're going here. They definitely focused on Lewis Field because that is where the canine units were tracking her to. Um, her scent, I don't, I don't know if her scent disappeared or it faded or, or what. I don't have details about the canine search. Um, yes, we know that she spoke to her mother. Um, her mother has told, um, authorities that there was, there was, she seemed upset about something, uh, when they spoke on the phone, but she did not want to talk about it. So Susan didn't push her, um, to talk about it, but she did sound upset. She did sound like something was on her mind, but she didn't, um, Susan didn't push her. So they didn't speak about what could have been bothering Brittany. Um, it could have been something little, it could have been something big, but in context, um, you know, you, it, it leaves you to wonder, you know, what, what could have been going on because now that we're looking right, we've got all these resources going to try and locate Brittany and look at all of this. I mean, if she had gone in this direction, so we're talking the home is in this area. If she had gone to the west, it appears, down Main Street towards Lewis Field, look at all of this area here. I mean, there's so much undeveloped land all right here. I mean, that's a daunting search to say the least. And, you know, where are you going to look first? So they brought in the helicopters. They brought in the canines. They were able to track her scent towards Lewis Field, but that is as far as I have been informed. So obviously, I don't have a source within the police department. I have spoken to Bethany. That's it. She's my source. And, um, you know, I got her to just double check things that I was putting out there. And she was able to, you know, essentially like corroborate what I was able to find out um, from mainstream media reporting about when the search went bigger and bigger, you know? Um, okay. So on January 17th, so the 15th is when everything started, right? 
the 17th, they expanded the search to include the woods along Route 9 and 148, which, okay, let's go back. Oh, my God. So Route 148 is here. So we're talking about woods here. And then Route 9 is, is Main Street. So we're talking about over here. So the search was expanded to include this. And yeah, it does look like a lot of wetland. Ben, does that sound familiar to you? Uh, is there another case you can think of that had a lot of wetlands involved? Um, it is a wildlife management area, so there wouldn't be a whole lot um, as far as um, traces of people inside those woods. Um, wildlife management areas are open to the public, but you're not... Uh, it's a carry in, carry out. You're not going to find, you know, trash from people, hopefully, anyway. Um, and you're not going to find structures where people live or spend a lot of time. There's not much of that happening in those areas at all. So, you know, they've got the canines looking, they've got the helicopters looking, and um, there was a search involving the water as far as... Um, where that was, I don't have specifics. I don't. Um, I do know that they did do some water searching, but yeah, I would hope so, right? Um, hopefully we'll learn more about that soon, but I'm, I'm not here to go into that case at all. So I know, um, at least from what I've been able to learn as far as reporting in the mass media again because that's where all this information is going to come from you're not going to walk into the police department in massachusetts and get information on an ongoing case it's just not going to happen so i have to rely on the sources that i have thankfully i have some um and you know get what i can get from from that uh, okay. Okay. There are, so, all right. We talked about the search. We talked about, okay. And another, the last thing I just really wanted to mention before I get into some of the rumors here is, um, last February, Joe Early, who has been mildly vocal about this case. He has spoken, um, a few times I saw him speak in January at the vigil for Brittany. Um, on February 24th of last year, Joe Early told the press that kidnapping is unlikely. And he did not expand on what helped them, what led them to that conclusion. Um, I am not, like I said, I am not here to speculate. So I have absolutely no idea why they would say that that's unlikely, but it does seem and it has seemed like they're focusing almost entirely on the immediate area and um, expanding from there. And it seems like they know something or have some kind of information that leads them to believe that no one picked her up, you know, but I don't know. And like I said, I'm not, I'm not going to speculate, but for Joe Early to come and front the media and say that kidnapping is unlikely um, that kills me. I want to know why I want to know, you know, what leads him to say that, what do they know? Of course, they're not going to give that information out to the public. So unfortunately we're left to wait for more information. And, um, on, in certain circumstances, people are left to speculate a lot about this and about what the police know and what they might've found. So, um, all right. Let's talk rumors for a minute. Um, does anyone have questions before I get to that about any of the information I just put out there, which is admittedly not a lot because again, we have a very limited amount of information about this case. We don't know what we don't know. You know, the police probably know a hell of a lot more than I do. Um, I do not. I don't. Um, I know that um, she, her mother said that while they were on the phone that evening, it seemed like something was bothering her, but Brittany didn't want to talk about it. That's what I know. 
Um, I don't have any knowledge about medication um, other than the mention of um, her sister administering psoriasis medication, which is something that my mom has had too. It's a shot. And that's that. Um, I don't know if they're on the same medication. I don't know if Brittany was on the same medication as my mom is, but I do know she takes shots um, for the psoriasis on a pretty regular basis and it helps keep it at bay. Um, but apart from that, as far as any medication she was on or any mental state, I don't know. Um, I know that her mom at the time, and I don't know if it's still true, um, lived in the next town in Spencer. So it was too far for her to walk is the point. I mean, you're not, and it's, again, like if you look at the map, it looks close, right? But we're talking about um, a long time to walk on a dark road in the middle of nowhere. And it, it doesn't seem like it would be, I mean, who knows? I'm not, I'm not in her head. I don't know what she was thinking at the time she went missing. So I don't know if maybe, hey, maybe she thought it was a good idea to take a walk. But I'm betting um, from what I've been able to find out about Brittany that that would not be something that she would take on. I mean, it was miles, many miles in, in a, you know, on a dark road in the freezing cold. Um, and she does, ha she did have a car. Um, it was still sitting in front of the home that she shared with her boyfriend um, the next, uh, when she was reported missing. So it was still out there because it wasn't working properly. It was broken. Um, so it was still there. It still had stuff in it. So that really didn't provide much information looking in the car. All right. Anything else guys, before I get into this? As far as not having much information, been able to talk for almost an hour. That's crazy. Um, her wallet and her phone are all she took with her. Um, there are rumors, and I was going to get into this first, actually. Um, there are several rumors going around about what she had with her when she disappeared. <clears throat> Some people are out there saying she had an iPad with her. Uh, others said that she had her laptop with her. This is not true. Um, according to her family, all she had on her when she left was her wallet and her phone. That's it. And there was a phone ping. Um, there has been a lot of... Um, rumors going around about where the last phone ping was because there are conflicting reports about that in the media. Um, let me pull the map, map back up so you guys know where I'm talking about when I say this. Um, let's go back to Brookfield Google Maps. And I will... Oh, okay. Here we go. Okay. So let me close this. All right. So again, I'll turn on the satellite that helps. All right. So again, we're talking about, oops, Main Street, Brookfield. Why are you not zooming? There we go. All right. So we're talking about this area, right? So there are three rumors going around about where her phone pinged last. And we have to remember now if her phone had no SIM card in it, in order to ping, it would need to connect to Wi-Fi. Just FYI. Um, I'm working on that, Fox. Like, I'm going to see what I can get, but I have to ask her family for any of that information. Um, because I can't go to the police and ask for it because it's an open case and they will not. Um, they'll deny any FOIA requests at this point, so... Um, all right. So there are three main spots that it's speculated that her phone pinged last. And I will tell you what I have found out as far as that goes. Um, there is a rumor that her phone last pinged at 
near Bay Path. Um, there's also a rumor that her phone last pinged near the state police barracks, which is down here. And then there is another rumor that her phone last pinged near the Brookfield Police Department, which is, oh, it's, oh, it's over in this area somewhere. I, oh, right here. I walked to there when I was in, in Brookfield. So we've got here, we've got here, and then we have the state police barracks, which is whoop, further down here, right here. So what I have been able to find out, and again, I don't know anything that the family doesn't know. Oh no, I'm sorry to hear that. I'm so sorry to hear that. I hope that your three-year-old is doing better. Uh, B. Austin, I really do. I know uh, how that feels and I feel your pain quite acutely. I've got two of them. They have outgrown the three-year itch, but <laughs> every year comes with its new uh, its new challenges. Anyway, um, so I have been able to verify um, what the police have been telling the family and all I have been able to find out is that Brittany's phone last pinged somewhere in the vicinity of this area. So this is the clam box restaurant. This is the state police barracks. Somewhere in this vicinity is the last phone ping. I don't know anything beyond that. Um, I do know, and like I said, I don't know everything about SIM cards anymore. It's been quite a few years since I've had to mess with something like that. But um, your phone sans a SIM is not going to ping anywhere because you don't have any cellular service without a SIM card. So in order to ping, if her SIM card was not inside the phone, she would have had to have connected to Wi-Fi. So it would have to be somewhere she either had been before that had Wi-Fi that her phone automatically connected to, or it would have to be a public Wi-Fi that she affirmatively connected it to. Again, that is not speculation. That is literally the only scenario I can think of as far as where, like how someone's phone would ping without a SIM card. And again, I don't know her carrier. I don't know um, who she used for cell phone service. So I, I don't know, but I do know that her SIM card was found in the house and she took her phone, which apparently wasn't working with her when she left. Um, all right. So the last no bank activity. No, um, there hasn't been any activity on her phone since that last ping. There has been no bank activity, um, at all. So, um, I'm going to get into the last rumor that I really wanted to address here, but I'm just wondering if there was anything else I wanted to bring up. I don't think so. Um, I don't think so. Did she have close friends? Yes. Yeah. Many of them were at that vigil that I attended last month or uh, in January. Um, she had many close friends. Uh, everybody that came out and everyone who's spoken out publicly about Brittany has emphasized just how lovely a person she was or is and how much they enjoy spending time with her how much they enjoy just being around her. So she was very, very well liked in, in the neighborhood, in the area. Um, but I don't know as far as geographically where these friends lived, how far they were from where she disappeared. So she maybe could have been trying to see a friend, but I, I don't know. We don't know. We don't have any way of knowing um, where her head was at when she walked out of the house. We don't know. Um, so the big rumor, the big ugly rumor, and I want to dispel this, um, in the gentlest way possible because all rumors, as anybody knows, have somewhat of a basis in truth. So, Bethany and I have spoken about this a couple of times and I just, I want to put this out there and I want to do it respectfully. 
Um, and I uh, wrote about it in my blog and I had this conversation with Bethany beforehand about the best way to put this information out there because there are lots of rumors going around um, on web sleuth forums, on citizen detectives, on comments, on news reports, um, in Facebook groups that Brittany was an alcoholic and that she was, that her family was trying to set up an intervention for her. Um, this is not true. Brittany did have her share of issues as far as alcohol was concerned in the past. Um, Bethany and I spoke about it. She said that, yeah, she had issues with alcohol dependence um, in the summer of 2023. But according to Bethany, she had been working very, very hard to overcome um, the dependence and throughout the fall and um, early winter. And by Christmas, Brittany was overcoming these issues on her own. She was in the best place, you know, that Bethany had seen her in all year long by Christmas. From, from all accounts, she was in a very healthy mind space. She was overcoming any past dependence she had. Um, to me, honestly, that says a lot about what who she is as a person. It tells me that she has amazing amounts of strength, um, determination, and motivation to deal with these issues on her own. Um, she she wasn't headed for an intervention. The family wasn't going through, you know, different ways to confront her about her alcohol dependence because she had taken the bull by the horns and dealt with this on her own. So she was no longer having issues with alcohol at the time of her disappearance. So I just like, and like I said, this isn't, you know, me trying to preach. This isn't me saying like, I know everything about this case. I know what I have been able to find out. And this is something that I've been able to find out. There were rumors running rampant about um, her family planning to confront her about alcohol use, about having dependence issues and planning an intervention. And this is not true. It is not a true statement. Um, Brittany was in a good place in January of 2023, you know, notwithstanding any issues she had that particular day, um, whatever was bothering her when she spoke to her mother. But she, she is a human being. I'm a human being. You're human beings. Everybody has flaws. Everyone has issues. Everyone has things that maybe they're not super proud of in their life. And Bethany and I spoke about this. She said, I'm not afraid to put this information out there because it is something about her, but I don't want this to be the one thing that people grasp onto and think about when they hear her name. She doesn't want the thing, the flaw that Brittany was dealing with to be the one thing that's out there about her. So I'm trying to put that to bed as best I can to the, what, 100 people that are watching right now. So Bethany, I did what I could. Um, so that is, that is pretty much all I have. Um, I will answer any questions that I'm able to. Um, I urge you to read, uh, my Substack, my blog about this because it's got, um, much more information as far as pings on the map and everything else, everything that I was able to compile together. So, um, could she, I don't know. Um, she did work at Bay Path, not at the time that she disappeared, but formerly she did work there. Um, she could have gone there and that was the last ping. Maybe they had Wi-Fi that her phone connected to. It's a thought. And this, um, Ben, thank you. That is that is 100% what I'm trying to put out there right now about this woman is that what the struggles that we deal with, the things that bring us, you know, down to earth and make us humans with, with issues and 
temptations, advices, and everything, that doesn't make you who you are as a person. And it should not be the one thing that's out there in the world about Brittany because she was so, 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 so much more as a person. She is a light to people. She is a lovely, kind, personable, welcoming, generous human being. And she should be talked about that way, not as somebody who had a struggle with a vice six months before she disappeared. Um, okay. So unsafe. What do you got? Let's see. Sorry to make you repeat, but the boyfriend's account. So, okay. So when she left the house, it was not long after she got off the phone with her mother and, um, she just walked out. Her boyfriend's account is that he assumed that Susan was coming to pick her up. He did not know for sure. And he didn't ask. So that is, he just said she left. That's the account. Um, as far as I have been able to find out, he has been cooperative with police. I am not going to speculate on his, um, on, on anything having to do with him. All I know is that he was cooperative and that he has been helping the police with whatever he can help with. Take from that what you want, but I won't speculate about somebody whose name isn't out there in the public. Oh, yes. Um, two days. So the timeline is thus, um, she allegedly walked out of the house at 8.30 at night on January 10th. Uh, she had not reached out to her family. Um, her boyfriend did not reach out to mom or Bethany to find out, hey, uh, is Brittany with you? Um, he didn't reach out. He And they uh, hadn't heard from her in a couple of days which was extremely out of character for her. She was very, she has always been a very um, conscientious person and she's always been very family oriented. So she is always the person to reach out. She's, it's very, very out of character for her to have not reached out to her family for a couple of days. So on the 12th, Bethany and Susan went to the Mass State Police and reported her missing. And then the next day on the 13th, they went to Brookfield Police to report her missing as well. So they reported her twice um, in a, I won't say like a two day span because I don't think it was. I think it was just hours in between. One ended up being the evening and the next ended up being the next morning. Um, anything else? It's weird, right? I mean, I've gone two days without talking to my mom, but it is very, very rare. It's very rare. My mom is my best friend, so it's very um, unusual for us to go more than 12 hours without talking to each other. Um, so if I didn't answer my mom's phone calls or texts for two days, she would probably have the same reaction. She, but she bugs Seth Rogen about me and he'd be like, nah, she's fine. So that would be that. Um, apparently it's very windy at my house and my dog is going apeshit. I went, I, I can't go, I, I can't go two hours without talking to Mr. Dobbs. Um, we're always, always in contact actually. Um, even when we're not, even when we're in the same house, we're texting each other. So, um, I think it's rare for the, what do you mean? What do you mean be Austin? I'm interested. Um, I, I have a lot of questions too, um, about, about the boyfriend, but again, I, I just, I can't speculate and I can't, um, I do know his name, but I'm not going to put it out there. And there's just no, that there's no public reason to bring him into this when all I've heard is that he has been cooperative and given the police everything, 
excuse me, that they've asked for from him. So I don't know. This, though, I do find odd. Um, I want to know why he didn't reach out to the T's to ask them, hey, did Brittany make it okay? Or when, you know, when are you coming home? Something like that. But again, I don't know. I, I don't know. Um, I, I hate that I can't really talk about it, but I'm not here to speculate because I respect the ethics of this way too much. I feel like I'm, I'm wielding a very tiny, tiny amount of power here, being able to speak publicly about cases like this. And this one is really, really close to my heart. Um, and I can't, I, I can't really describe why. Um, she's younger than me. Uh, we're from different places. I don't know her as a person, but I feel like when I went to this vigil and I listened to her family and her friends talk about her, I thought to myself, she deserves to be found. She deserves for people to be talking about her case in public all the time. I want to know everything I can find out about this. And I want to put it all out there as long as it's facts so that somebody else today says her name besides me. I want somebody else to say her name in public because there are too many missing women in this country, specifically even in this area of Massachusetts. There have been missing women in this area for many years and their cases kind of just fade out of the news. They fall by the wayside and it, it should not be that way. I mean, this is a 35 year old woman in the prime of her life, getting her shit together and moving up in the world and becoming, you know, this healthy, lovely person in this good mindset. And all of a sudden she's gone. There is absolutely no reason that her case or anybody else's should be fading from, from the public eye. So this is my way of saying her name is Brittany T. Go out in public and say it. Print a flyer, put it up somewhere. Because who knows, if nobody watching this video has seen anything or knows anything, if you print out that flyer and put it out in public somewhere, maybe someone who does know something will see that number and call it. It just, I feel a very large urge to do something. So this is my something. This is me urging you guys to just put her name out there somewhere. Share her flyer on Facebook. Something. Just get it out to one person who hasn't seen it before. And I feel like I've done something. So that's that's my rant. That's my whole rant. Uh, okay. Is it possible they were fighting? Yeah, possible. We have not been told that that was the case, though. Um, he didn't text her for two days, but we don't know that because she doesn't have a functioning phone. So he could have tried, but we don't know. I don't know um, what the situation was as far as removing the SIM card. I don't know if he was aware that her phone was broken, but I assume he had to be because she had to use his cell phone to call her mother. So I assume he was aware it wasn't working. So maybe that's why he didn't try to get in touch with her on her cell phone if he didn't, but we don't know if he didn't. Um, I heard there's another, Jesus. Ben, send me an email when you get the info because I would love to look into that too. Um, I want to, I want to learn all of it and preach all of it if I can. Um, yeah, exactly. Unsafe. Um, oh, I thought they found her. I'm not positive though. Um, okay. Does anyone else have any questions, thoughts, comments? Love for the bloodhound.
So we'll go um, till 9.15, a couple more minutes. If you guys had anything else you wanted to say, um, I will. Well, I've, I've shared her flyer a few times on my Facebook, but I'm going to bookmark it. I'll pin it again. Ah, oh, thank you. I will look into that. Be Austin. I would love it. I would love to know what's going on there. I'll pin it on my Facebook page so you guys can share it. And again, no pressure. Like I'm not telling anyone what to do, but I think it's important to circulate things like this, especially missing flyers because they have all the pertinent information on them. Um, but please just, I, I mean, it takes no time. It takes no effort. It takes no time to just hit share. You know, that's all I'm asking for. So, uh, if there's nothing else I did, um, just want to say one more time, thank you so much to Bethany T to Susan T for your kind words about my writing, about the blog. And I really hope that, um, you watched tonight and thought I am doing right by your daughter. If you have any comments or anything that you want me to um, elaborate on or provide more detail on, or um, if you want me to shut up, <laughs> please just let me know. You know how to reach me. So um, if there's nothing else, I'm going to sign off, but we'll do another one. Um, this, this was my whole goal sassy pants. I, I appreciate you saying that because my whole goal in actually before I go, my goal in this, um, in this space of true crime podcasting, true crime, YouTubing, whatever you want to call it. I have a purpose here that I've thought long and hard about. Um, and I've actually spoken to a couple of people on this. I've been given a lot of recommendations on um, how to go about it, um, different speakers to listen to, to make sure I'm doing things the right way. Anyway, I, I want to come at all of this from a place of deep, heartfelt respect. I am not here to speculate, as I've said about a hundred times tonight, I'm not here to put my theory out there on what happened to anybody. Um, I know we discussed some theories in the Jean Benet case last week, um, but that's a different animal. When I'm talking about cases that I'm reporting on after getting permission from family members, I want to come at this as ethically and as respectfully as possible. I will not put out any misinformation. I will not put out any rumors that I can't substantiate as fact. And my only goal here is to raise awareness for somebody who can't, maybe can't speak for themselves at the moment. You know, I just want to put people's names out there so that maybe somebody who knows something hears it. That's all. I'm not here to sensationalize. I'm not here to capitalize on anyone's pain or tragedy. I'm here to simply bring awareness and to do my tiny part putting information out here um, about these cases and hopefully help in any small way that I can. So that's that. <laughs> um, Ben, I'll be in touch about that. Um, once all, thanks for joining. I um, got your email and I will be getting back to you soon. And Suzanne, that's exactly where I'm trying to come from is, is to be as ethical as possible because people who know me also know that ethics is my entire job. So I need to, um, I need to come at this from the right place. And I feel like my heart's in the right place. I just want to keep I just want to keep putting it out there. Um, Dana. <laughs> uh, good stuff. Uh, of all the cases out there, how do you choose which to follow? That's a really good question, actually. Really, really good question. Um, as far as covering um, before when I covered Molly's case, um, that came from basically 
uh, I was talking to Melanie um, McLaughlin, who is the woman who made the documentary, Have You Seen Andy? about the Andy Puglisi case back in Lawrence from the 70s. Um, we were working together uh, for filming a documentary for Dave and Kevin, and her and I started having a conversation. She said that she knows the family, um, that you know, it could always, this case could always use another look, maybe turn your um, bloodhound investigation skills that way. So that's how I got into looking at Molly's case. But as far as Brittany's case, it literally was just, I saw her picture on the flyer and thought to myself, she looks like she looks like somebody I would be friends with. And my heart just kind of went out to her. So I, I reached out to her sister on Facebook and I talked to her. I just had a conversation with her and I said, look, if you're not okay with me talking about your sister's case or blogging about it or whatever, tell me to go away. But I told her where I was coming from on this. I said, I really want to do my tiny part, um, putting information out there. And we've always had a very respectful dialogue about everything. So it just, it comes from, I don't know what it is exactly, Dana. I think this one just kind of came out of nowhere for me, but Molly's case was the product of being put on the scent by somebody else. Okay, you can see the hoodie. Uh, Mr. Dubs bought me this hoodie for, for my birthday last year um, because he gets me. So I'm not saying that I don't love true crime because I obviously do. I love Dateline. I love, you know, understood, trying to understand a case from start to finish. But when I want to put information out there with my face on it and my voice on it, it is going to come from a place of not sensationalizing, but gently and respectfully putting information out so that hopefully somebody hears something that they recognize. So, um, yeah, he gets me. What the fox? He gets me. Um, he's a good man. So anyway, if anyone has anything else, um, Fox, you linked the Substack earlier, right? I believe you did. I think you did. Um, in any case, if you guys aren't following me on um, Facebook. I'm the true crime bloodhound on Facebook. That's where you're going to find pretty much all the links to uh, merch, to blogs, to any other events that I have going on, like um, new lives coming out or any dines that I'm doing because I do another show on this channel called um, True Crime and Dine, where we talk about cold cases and we eat food. Um, well, I make food and then I turn the camera off and I um, overeat food. So it's um, it, it's turned into a little pet project. It's kind of a way to uh, show off my improving cooking skills and um, to talk about some stuff out there in the zeitgeist that maybe, um, you know, isn't solved. We talked about uh, last week or the week before we talked about Judy Buig and we talked about Debbie Quimby a little bit. We talked about the other unsolved cases in the Townsend, Fitchburg, Lemonster area in the seventies, which I'm trying very, very hard to get more information on so that I can actually make a serious sit down show about it. Um, but the going is very, very slow. It's 50 years old, so it's very hard to find anyone who was involved or knows anything about the investigation. So um, we soldier on. So also, I just wanted to give a quick shout out to um, Angel from Tr Crime of the Truest Kind, who I had the privilege of meeting a couple of weeks ago at her live show on uh, at the Off Cabot. Um, she's lovely. And I just wanted to say thank you so much for the uh, way too long conversation with me and um, keep up the good work. You're doing a great job. So if you guys don't follow 
try a uh, crime of the truest kind. You should give them a follow. It's, it's awesome. She does a great job. Um, and she comes from the same place as I do as far as respect and non sensationalism. So, um, yeah. So if nobody has anything else, uh, I'm going to sign off so we can eat some food and, um, that's that. So if you guys want to give me a follow, uh, we'll talk another case next week that I have been looking into. Um, I won't give any details here, but it's going to be an interesting one. So until then, guys, thank you for watching and we'll see you next time.